So just to review for a second from, from last time, we talked about lymphatic vessels, and this is how the lymph, the extra fluid that ends up in your tissues when you have inflammation, um, gets filtered, and, and then that fluid's going to dump back into your subclavian veins. What along the way that are considered secondary lymphoid organs filter that lymph? They're named after lymph. Lymph nodes. <laughs> right? Lymph nodes. Uh, what is the organ that filters your blood? Spleen. Your spleen, right? And that's the one organ you can actually live without, although you probably wouldn't want to, but you can. Um, what are your primary lymphoid organs? Remember, this is where your B cells and T cells are born and then educated. Right, so bone marrow for your B cells, right? They leave there fully educated. And then for your T cells, it's your thymus. Those are your primary lymphoid organs. So in addition, right, we have tonsils. We talked about the one in the back of your nose and the commonly referred to as the adenoids, which is your nasopharyngeal tonsil, your palatine tonsils, which are the ones shown here in your throat, and then other places um, where they come in contact are, is your appendix, where you have a lot of B cells and T cells, and then all along your mucus layers, you have your mucus-associated lymphoid tissue, right, commonly referred to as your malt, or if you're looking under the microscope, you can even see these, what we call Pryor's patches in the small intestines. And then what's your skin-associated lymphoid tissue is commonly referred to as the salt. And again, this is where you have B cells and T cells. It's not organized to the organ level, it's a tissue, right? So you have specialized cells working together to help protect you. So today we're actually going to get into the specific interaction between the cells. So between the T cells and the B cells and the macrophages and your just normal cells. So communication is key for our cells. And one of the ways we've seen them do this is releasing cytokines, right? These chemical messages. Another way is they physically will attach to each other. And we saw this when we watched the video on um, how T cells are checked out before they leave the thymus. So these markers are very important for T cell communication with our body, right? And these markers that are found on all of our cells are abbreviated MHC, which stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. And the reason why I got that name is we had a major problem right, with compatibility because of these molecules found on the surface of our cells. You want to try and match us as closely as you can when doing organ and tissue transplants. And the only person that would be an exact match for you would be, anyone know? Your identical twin, because you're identically genetically the same. That's why they, can, they have to be the same sex. <laughs> Where with fraternal, it's a whole different ball of wax, right? You're talking about just two organisms sharing the womb at the same time. They're two separate eggs. They're two separate sperm. And that's why they can be boy-girl. So how many of you guys have got an identical twin? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> so we don't we don't have a backup person for spare parts. There's some sci-fi movies out there, right, where they talk about cloning people for spare parts. Other than that, probably the closest match you will get is a relative, again, because all this stuff is encoded in your DNA, right? It's in your uh, genetic makeup. So this creates a real problem when we're trying to do tissue and organ transplants for people. So those markers are on all of your cells, and there's two different classes. Class 1 is what's found on all nucleated cells and antigen-presenting cells in your body. So this is the major communicator, MHC class 1. And T cells can only communicate with certain MHC. And it depends on what type of T cell it is. So we, we've looked at this previously too when we watched that video. There are two types of CD markers. 
There's CD4 and there's CD8. And that helps to note the different types of T cells and what other cells they can communicate with it. So we'll take a look at that. Dendritic cells are, remember, phagocytic cells, but they do more than just that. They present information, right? That's one of the things that we're going to really look into a lot of detail today. And so that ability to present information to T cells helps activate those T cells. So as I said, we have two different MHCs, MHC class 1, and all it is is it's a, a protein receptor that they put on their surface, and in that little cleft here, they're going to have a piece, typically a protein, a piece of an antigen they've been exposed to, as well as they're always presenting their own antigens on their surface as well for inspection. The reason why this is this is necessary for endogenous antigens is because, as I said, it's on all your cells. So all nucleated cells, this includes macrophages and, and um, dendritic cells that purposely take stuff in, right? But think about what could get inside of our cells and create a problem. We would want to be able to alert that signal, send that information on the surface of our cells. What's going to get in in order to multiply no matter what? Viruses. Viruses, right? So we definitely need protection for all of our cells against viral attack. And MHC1 plays a major role in identifying that type of infection. As well as some bacteria get inside, some protozoa or intercellular parasites. So endogenous means within. So Anything gets into any of our cells, we can present that information accordingly. Type 2 is specifically just for our antigen-presenting cells. And that's endogenous antigen. So in order for antigens that usually stay outside or have a period of time that they're outside of our body, outside of our cells, I should say, we have to have a way of, of detecting and responding to things that are outside of ourselves. So MHC class 2 allows us to do that. And there's a special grouping of cells that have this marker. We collectively refer to them as antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. Your APCs are your macrophages, your B cells, and your dendritic cells. And as we've talked about before, your macrophages and your dendritic cells are your phagocytic cells, right? They're going around, they're gobbling stuff up from the outside. And they need to wait, uh, present it to the immune system saying, hey, I picked this up from outside of a cell. Right? We need to respond in a way we would to things that stay or spend a, a set amount of time outside of ourselves. Now, B cells, these are our B lymphocytes, these are very important for producing antibodies, right? Which are one of those extracellular protections we have. Antibodies don't go inside of our cells, right? They stay outside of cells. So they have to be able to present antigens so that they can become activated. So here we have a cell, and all the time, as I said, it's breaking up pieces of stuff that's inside of it or stuff that has gotten inside of it. So cell proteins and foreign proteins will be digested by any one of your cells. And they're going to present that information on their cell surface for, for inspection by your immune system. So it goes through a process where it binds with the MHC class 1 molecules, right? These are proteins. They'll be packaged appropriately by the Golgi apparatus and sent to the cell membrane. 
Now, for a foreign protein like you see here, if a T cell comes along and it recognizes that, then it can respond accordingly. Of course, we should not recognize self-proteins, right? So notice that one just went along its merry way. Phagocytic cells, like macrophages, dendritic cells, they purposely engulf stuff. Right? So they take stuff from the outside. And especially if it came from the outside, they're going to package it with MHC class 2. And this is a different communication signal. Right? They're presenting in a different way. They're saying, this came from the outside. I gobbled it up. It's foreign. Anybody out there recognize this? And hopefully, a set of your T cells will recognize it and come along and interact with it. So your cells are constantly doing this, right? Doing this antigen presentation. So T cells play a little bit different role than B cells. They never produce antibodies like B cells. And they must have antigen presented to them, whether it be by one of our somatic cells, one of our nucleated cells, or one of our antigen presenting cells. On the flip side of that, B cells can interact directly with antigen. Effector T cells directly interact with target cells. So they actually do something. So we know there's two ways we can present MHC class 1 or 2. One is for stuff inside of any of our cells. Two is specialized for those antigen presenting cells. And here they just have um, B cells and macrophages. I don't know why they have de don't have dendritic cells written. The reason for these differences will account for the different types of T cells and their different jobs. So start learning these two terms as being synonymous. Cytotoxic T cells are commonly referred to as CD8 T cells because they have that marker on the surface of their cells they can communicate with MHC class 1. Now think about the name cytotoxic. What do you think this T cell is going to do to a cell that's presenting MHC class 1 something foreign? It's going to kill it. Right? It's toxic. It's going to kill it. So as I said all our cells are a potential target Right, because they all could be presenting stuff from within that's foreign. And of course, the cytotoxic T cell, what's it going to do? It's going to induce that target cell to undergo apoptosis. Does anybody remember what that is? Cell death. Program cell death. There's one key important point about apoptosis, though. It doesn't elicit a very common immunological response. No inflammation. Right, no inflammation in that case. And again, exogenous, usually stuff that came from the inside. Helper T cells, as their name implies, they tend to help, right? They have the marker CD4 on them. That allows them to communicate specifically with MHC class 2. And as we said, that's on your B cells, your macrophages, your dendritic cells. These what we collectively refer to as antigen presenting cells. And T, the helper T cell does just that. It helps that target cell. So it's going to help them become activated. So it'll activate B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Oh, I probably know why they don't have dendritic cells on this list, because they rate activates target cell. So in the case of dendritic cells, they usually activate the T cell. It goes the other way. We'll get to that. I always wondered why they didn't have dendritic cells on this list. I just answered my own question. So, mnemonics. You guys know what a mnemonic is?
right? It helps you remember things. So those of you guys in A and P too have probably heard, never let monkeys eat bananas. What does that mnemonic go with? White blood cells. In the order of abundance from most abundant to least abundant in normal blood. Neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, eosinophils, then basophils. Right. So my mnemonic for remembering um, helper T cells or CD4 cells is I remember 4-H. I remember, everybody knows about 4-H, right? Helps kids learn about animals. But 4 for CD4, H for helper T cell. Well, if you remember 4-H, you'll never forget helper T cells or CD4 T cells. And they go with MHC class 2, and again, you know, 2 times 2 equals 4. Now, CD8, this is a play on words for me for remembering this one. CD8, the, the number 8 sounds like to eat, to eight, to eat something, right? To destroy something, to break something down. And that's what cytotoxic T cells do, right? They're going to cause the destruction of other cells. So I always think eight, eat, number eight, right? These are deadly eater cells. So those have worked for me for years. Hopefully they'll help you guys out, right? And these are very important numbers, especially in a, in a, um, if you're going into, um, medical field, um, because of HIV infection. So the HIV virus specifically targets the helper T cells, the CD4. So a lot of times they'll run a very expensive special test where they are specifically looking at someone's helper T cell, uh, that CD4, and they'll usually refer to it as their CD4 count. And so that's what they're talking about. They're talking about these very important helper T cells, how debilitated that population is for someone with that infection. So, same thing as the other chart, but now, now some drawings um, to go along with it. So, T cells, as we found out, they all have a T cell receptor. And as we saw in that animation, that's actually what's going to come in contact with the antigen being presented by the MHC. So, in the case of any of our nucleated cells, right, they have MHC class 1, and they're presenting all these different antigens. That T cell receptor is what's going to interact with the antigens. The reason why these two cells talk to each other is because this CD8 recognizes MHC class 1. Right. That's how they know. It's like their secret handshake. That's how they know they talk, they're allowed to talk to each other. That's the cells that are supposed to communicate with each other. On the other hand, for CD4, that CD4 marker allows them to communicate with just MHC class 2. So just with these antigen-presenting cells, dendritic cells, B cells, and macrophages. They're the only ones that have MHC class 2. And so they're the only ones that can talk to the helper T cells. And of course they need to, because the helper T cell is going to hopefully help them out. Dendritic cells are really awesome antigen-presenting cells. They're our, they're our main presenters for getting this information to our adaptive immune response. So as I mentioned earlier but didn't show in the last picture, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells do have MHC class 1 on their surface. So if they say engulf uh, debris or damaged um, cells, or if they themselves get infected with something, they can present using MHC class 1. I'm not a huge fan of this drawing because it's not, it's hard to see the details. <laughs> right? You gotta kind of try and point them out. So, for this dendritic cell, right, and remember they're going to travel throughout the body and they're going to pick stuff up and they'll travel through the lymph and they'll go to a lymph node or they're right there in the mucus associated lymphoid tissue and they're going to bring this information right to um, the T cells. Okay, They're going to go to those T cells wherever they are and share this information they picked up. 
So notice right here, this kind of brown on brown, that's labeled as MHC class 1, and it's holding an antigen. So you see how there's brown ones on this guy? Those are the MHC class 1s. One of the things I hate is they labeled this one, but then down here, notice this one is the one that's actually presenting. And it's color-coded. Most people don't realize that, though, right? So this is MHC class 1. And even if I didn't know that, right, I should be able to deduce that that's MHC class 1 because what type of cell is he talking to? A CD8, which we know is synonymous with a cytotoxic, right? And cytotoxics only communicate with MHC class 1. Still with me? All right, you guys are already getting it. Good. So same thing here. They also have MHC class 2. So that kind of bluish or whatever color that is. Green? I guess it's green. Oh, boy. Um, is presenting to the CD4, which we know the other name for a CD4 is a helper T cell. right? So that has to be MHC class 2. So here, naive, right, and that's what we call T cells when they're first born and they've never seen antigen before. I always think of them just like kids, right? They have no idea how bad the world is until something bad happens to them. They're naive to it. So these T cells are naive, right? They have not experienced antigen yet. But when they get that presented to them by the dendritic cell, this will activate them. Now, this is only one step in multiple step process with cytokines and other receptors on the surface of these cells interacting with each other. But we're going to keep it at this, sim this simplistic level, right? It's not a graduate level immunology class, right? <laughs> so in one of, your, one of your classmates, I think, had posted a video that showed some of this interaction, and they went into all the detail, right? We're going to keep it at this level. Right, but know that there's a lot more communication that happens. This is just the first step. Make sense? So if everything goes right, then that T cell is going to be activated. And activation always for your lymphocytes is going to mean proliferation and differentiation. Proliferation means that they're just going to copy themselves. They literally make clones of them. So now instead of just having one T cell that recognizes that antigen, you have hundreds, thousands, millions, right, that are produced. And they're going to run out in, in search of those cells that are infected right? or help out other cells that are going to help produce products with that. So helper T cells, as the name implies, they're going to go and help other cells. Well, if a dendritic cell activates it, who's the other two cells he can communicate with? Only antigen presenting cells. So dendritic cells off the list. What are the other two? Mm -hmm. All right, y'all been paying attention. Yep, macrophages and B cells, right? So those army of helper T cells are going to go now help out the B cells and the macrophages in this fight that's going on in our bodies. Now, if a cytotoxic T cell is activated, it's going to go look specifically for any cell, right? Because it can interact with any cell with MHC class 1 presenting this antigen. And they're going to cause that cell to die. Can both these things happen if you get infected with something? Absolutely. Right? You can get a helper T cell response, you can get a cytotoxic T cell response, and definitely with viruses it is helpful to have both of these responses. Because there is a time when these cells are outside of your, that the, the viruses are outside your cells, right? Now B cells, what do they produce? What do they produce after they differentiate? Antibodies. Right, so again, that's why this CD4, right, when it's helping out B cells, we're, we're producing an exogenous, right, something that's going outside of our cells, antibodies that's going to help protect outside of our cells. But even with viruses, that's beneficial, right? Because there's a time when they're outside of our cells. We could attach to them and stop them from entering our cell if those antibodies attach. 
Anyone know what that's called, what outcome of antibody and antigen binding when it binds to a virus and stops it from entering into our cells? That virus has, and we, we say the same thing for a toxin. They've been neutralized, right? That's the neutralizing ability of antibodies. Now, of course, over here they're showing you if they don't recognize or they don't get that co-stimularity response, then these cells will go energic, which means they won't, they're just not going to do anything, and they may even die over time, right? If they don't find a match, they'll die off. It's only when they are activated they're going to proliferate, differentiate, and go do the jobs that they're intended to do. So that critical role for T cells of activation and proliferation is done by the interaction it has with the dendritic cells. They're major players in getting our T cells involved in the interaction. So dendritic cells, as I said, scattered all throughout your body, in your peripheral tissues, they're in the lymph nodes, they're everywhere. And they're going to gather up stuff by phagocytosis and pinocytosis, right, where they take a, even take in small molecules. Pino is small. And partly why they get their name is they have the ability to stretch out long projections, right, even in between cells, and grab on to antigens. So they're almost like tentacles. Remember the toll-like receptors? These are general receptors on our cells that help us identify the bad guys. So if a pathogen is detected, if it detects that, then it's going to really gobble up more material, right? If those receptors on its surface are triggering, you know, presence of bad guy, it's going to grab as many samples as it can, right? It's going to engulf more so than it was doing before. And then it's going to travel to secondary lymphoid organs. It's going to go where the B cells and T cells are. Specifically those T cells, because now it's going to go activate them. And as we said, it can, it can present both MHC1 and 2. And then macrophages and B cells as well are, can present on MH class 2 molecules. And this is because they have to talk to the helper T cells. And again, additional signaling has to happen for these interactions. So this is one of my favorite ones from the first website that I sent you guys to. Right? There's a killer T cell. Right? So this is cytotoxic CD8 right? T cell. And so if our cells get infected with a virus, a bacteria, if they become cancerous, those antigens are on the surface of those cells and that's how this guy knows that he needs to pull the trigger and eliminate those cells before they can be harmful to the whole organism. So we've already kind of looked at, right, we're going to look at some more similarities and differences between helper T cells, so T with this little H denotes the helper T cells and T with the little C denotes the cytotoxic T cells. Which remember, remember the CD4 markers when we talk about these, right? So for helper T cells, it's CD4, cytotoxic T cells, CD8. So here's a virus, right? It's taken up by a target cell. That target cell, if it can, as this virus is multiplying and stuff, hopefully some of the viral components, especially the protein components, will be picked up by the cell and presented on the surface. Remember, this is MH class 1. And here is this guy. And this is where I want to pause. 
So here's our cytotoxic T cell, right? So here's MHC class 1. That's the T cell receptor because it's coming in contact with the antigen. And what is this marker here? That's the CD8, right, that's interacting. Notice it touches the MHC class 1. So if you go back and watch that animation link that I sent you guys for T cell development, remember, when it begins in that development, it, it, it becomes either a CD4 or a CD8 cell, right? And, and that's based on which they're recognizing. Are they recognizing MHC class 1 or MHC class 2? And they're stuck in that path, right? When they leave the thymus, they're either a helper T cell or a cytotoxic T cell. They're either CD8 or CD4. They don't have both. When they're first born, they have both, right? And then the body figures out and calls out who's going to be what and get those signals. So this cell is recognizing it. Right? It'll get other co-stimulatory symbols, it's, it's, uh, stimuli they're not showing you here. But then it's releasing particular cytokines, particular molecules that's going to lead to the death of that infected cell. Right? So hopefully we can stop the spread of this virus to other cells, especially if we disrupt it early, early on in its replication. Now that cytotoxic T cell... That CD8 can go and find other cells maybe nearby and eliminate them if they're expressing that foreign antigen. So effector functions of your CD8 cytotoxic T cells. Right? And this is just a diagram of what we just saw in that animation. Right? They're going to communicate with these cells via MHC class 1. If that cell, right, it recognizes it's going to cause the death of that cell. Program cell death. We're not going to elicit inflammation. All right, so helper T cells, CD4 T cells, can only communicate with cells that are presenting antigen on MHC class 2. So these are, as we said, our antigen-presenting cells. They're going to activate with cytokines, and they may even recognize different epitopes. Because remember when we talk about an antigen, it actually can have lots of different pieces on it. Right. So we can recognize different components. B cells likely recognize an epitope on an antigen surface. And the reason for this is B cells can interact directly with the antigen. Right? And it's, it's not been digested or anything like that. So we can interact with it directly. So typically it's stuff on its surface. Especially if you're talking about a bacteria or a virus. We're going to talk about the stuff on the outside where T cells will help recognize a peptide that may have come within. And this is because they're recognizing stuff that's been potentially digested by a macrophage or a dendritic cell. A conjugated vaccine against what we call a T-independent antigen. So this is an antigen where the B cell doesn't need any help from the T cell to become activated and produce antibodies. It can do it on its own. In this case, so the capsule to the bacteria Haemophilus influenzae, that's an outside covering, right? That's a T independent antigen. Usually the, the B cell can produce antibodies against it without needing any help from the T cell. It converts to a T-dependent when we covalently attach it to a protein. So that's what they mean by conjugated. The B cell will respond to the capsule component very easily. And the helper T cells will help respond to the protein component and therefore 
additionally activate our B cells. So we get a really good, strong response when we put these two things together, when we get both types of activation. What a haptin is, is a very small molecule that can bind to a B-cell receptor. But because they're so tiny, it doesn't elicit a response from our body. It's got to be hooked on to something else. And typically, unfortunately, this is what happens. Penicillin allergy, right? Penicillin is a pretty small protein molecule. Actually, is it considered a protein? actually don't know what class of molecules is considered, but it will bind to proteins in our body. When it does that, it becomes large enough that the immune system can respond to it. This happens too with uh, um, the substances in poison oak and poison ivy, um, people who are allergic to things like nickel. It, that really small by itself wouldn't really cause an allergic, wouldn't cause an immune response. But when it attaches to proteins found in our body, it becomes large enough to elicit a response. So helper T cells are important in helping activate our macrophages. So our macrophages are always gobbling stuff up, right? But under certain circumstances, especially when we have invasion, if a helper T cell recognizes the peptides that are being presented on that MHC class 2 of the macrophage, this is like a confirmation for the macrophage to become more of a killing house, right? Become more aggressive because we've definitely identified a specific invader that we need to go after and destroy. So it the macrophage increases its metabolism, the mo number of lysosomes it has, right? So those packages of digestive enzymes. It produces nitric oxide and other toxic compounds that it wouldn't normally produce when it's not activated, right? So they become really super killing machines. They can also fuse together and form what's called giant cells. And this definitely happens when you have um, tuberculosis. Because unfortunately, our macrophages cannot kill tuberculosis. It can grow inside of our macrophages. So one of the things that our macrophages do is they keep traveling to the area and they'll fuse together to try and keep the mycobacteria tuberculosis trapped. So they do their, their best to keep it all in one spot. So B cells, two major things for them. They can come in contact with antigen directly. So notice in this first picture, you have a B cell with its B cell receptor, which, was, which remember, is actually an antibody, right, that it, it will later secrete. Anybody remember which two classes of antibodies is actually found in the surface of the B cell as the receptor? Remember, we have IgG, IgM, IgE, IgD, and IgA. D and M. M. M is the major player, right? But remember, that one, when we secrete it, mega big pentamer, right? But on the surface of the B cell, right, this is class M or D, mostly M. So notice that this is coming in contact with an antigen. Really, they're showing you this one, you know, as a little... Um, box almost reminds me of uh, Rubik's Cube, <laughs> right? But they're showing you that it's only interacting with one, just one of these little squares, right? What we would call the epitope of that antigen. And it engulfs it not all that different from how uh, macrophages and dendritic cells engulf things. And it's going to break it into pieces. And it's going to present it on MHC class 2. 
And what this is going to allow is it for it to communicate with the helper T cells. Because remember, helper T cells only communicate with MHC class 2, and they can only communicate with cells that are presenting antigen. They themselves can't interact with antigen all by itself. So notice here, right, it's recognizing the T cell receptors, recognizing you've got your CD4 um, marker that's recognizing your MHC class 2. And then there's other co-stimularity um, interactions that are happening. And there's communication by cytokines to this B cell. So the T cell is saying, yep, I recognize this specific antigen. Right? And this may have even been a T cell that was activated by a dendritic cell earlier. Right? But if this T cell recognizes it communicates that information to the B cells, again, like a confirmation. Yes, this is a bad guy. We need to respond appropriately. So whenever a cell becomes activated, what's the first step? Proliferation, right? Lots and lots of copies. And then differentiation, if necessary, right? To be able to do its next job. Which for B cells, there's a major differentiation that happens. You have ones that turn into plasma cells. And then you remember the awesome component of our immune system is that all the stuff that happens, we have the ability to what? Remember it. And the, how we do this is memory cells are produced. Each time we get this activation, that differentiation is we got ones that are going to do the job, and then we got ones that stick around and remember what happened, right, those memory cells. That holds true for any B cell or T cell that's activated. You're going to have memory cells produced each time this happens. Notice again, if there isn't something for the T cell to recognize, then that's the end of the story, right? Nothing happens. So this selection process, and, and it's very similar to the selection process that happens for our T cells, right? Making sure they don't recognize self, Make sure that they can communicate with MHC class 1 or 2. When you have clones, and what we mean by clones are copies, right? So we have lots of different B cells out there. Each one of them is a unique. But once they become activated, it's just a small set of cells that become activated. And they make copies of each other. So they're literally clones. They're genetically identical. That's what we mean by clones. So, although this isn't a, it doesn't look like an antibody, the reason why I will surmise that this probably is representing a B cell is because it's interacting with antigen all by itself. It's not being presented by another cell. And again, it's a very specific interaction. Notice that the little crowns that these bad guys are wearing, he's only recognizing this specific one. Because this is down to a molecular level of, of recognition. So in our bone marrow is where our B cells are born. So are our T cells. But that selection process, right, is going to happen in the thymus, that second level of maturation. So lots of B cells are born, right? They'll travel from the bone marrow to places like your lymph nodes, your malt, um, your salt, your mucus, and, and lymphoid-associated tissues. Each one of these B cells, when it's born, it's naive, right? It's never seen um, an antigen yet. But each one of them has a different antibody that it's selected. Remember, it rearranged its DNA to do this and set this course in motion for itself. It would have been eliminated in the bone marrow if it was recognizing self antigens. So these guys don't recognize self, hopefully, and they've matured and now they're just waiting for their dream antigen. Right? But notice, as I said, each one of them is different. Here they're representing it by different colored antibodies. Right? Each one's different. So here we have some antigen. Came floating maybe through the lymph to a lymph node. 
This particular B cell recognizes it because the antigen and antibody are binding, that B cell receptor. It's going to go through a process where it's going to internalize now that antigen. This guy has been selected because it is recognizing antigen. So now it's going to internalize. Notice it brought the antibody antigen complexes all together in one area. And they're showing it's been activated. Right, so it made copies of itself. Right, activation, proliferation, right, they're all the same. Now we get differentiation, where some of them become plasma cells, some become memory cells. The plasma cells, right, they get really big, rough endoplasmic reticulum because antibodies are proteins, right, so they can secrete and produce lots and lots of these antibodies. Now, one thing that wasn't shown that may need to happen is you may need that activation, right, of uh, the B cell or a T cell. So notice here, something like a macrophage or a dendritic cell is engulfing something like a virus. It's presenting on MHC class 2. The helper T cell recognizes this by its T-cell receptor. One of the things they're not showing you is it's CD4, right? It's a helper T-cell, it'd be CD4, right? Now it can go communicate with that B-cell and help activate it. Again, what's IL? Those are, yeah, those are cytokines. They're a group of cytokines called interleukins. Because that's a white blood cell talking to a white blood cell, right? Inter meaning in between leukin meaning white blood cell right so sometimes b cells can be selected proliferate right be activated proliferate differentiate into those two groups without the help of the t cell we call that t independent antigens sometimes you need that t cell to activate it those of course are then t dependent antigens where you need that extra step where the t cell is going to elicit the, inf the activation, proliferation, and then differentiation of the B cell. So, clonal selection theory, populations of B cells and T cells. So even though we looked at this for B cells, the same thing happens for T cells. They got to be recognizing the antigen, they got to be activated, then they will proliferate, and they will differentiate. So they're able to recognize functionally limitless number of antigens. Do you remember we rearrange our DNA to produce all different types of T cell receptors and B cell receptors? Each cell only recognizes a response to a single epitope, a little piece of that antigen. Diversity, remember, is random. Right? They pick different segments of their DNA and put them together. They play the lottery all the time. So the, once they pick their numbers, right, they've made their B cell and T cell receptors, they go hang out in the secondary lymphoid organs, right, in your spleen, in your lymph nodes, in your malt, in your tonsils, and they're just waiting for that dream antigen to come by, right? They're perfect fit. Specificity of the antigen receptors governs its recognition, right? It's right down to that molecular level. Confirmation from another cell type is usually needed. So, right, sometimes the B cells need help to become activated. B cells then begin multiplying and generating populations of clones capable of making appropriate antibodies to that specific antigen right down to its epitope. Some of the prodigy will leave the secondary lymphoid organs, will actually migrate to the tissues and respond right there on site where the problem is happening. 
and they'll continue to respond as long as antigen is still present. Once the antigen, once the invader has been eliminated, they're going to undergo apoptosis, right? We're not going to maintain thousands and millions of, of B cells in the plasma cell state secreting antibodies when we don't need them, right? That's just a waste of energy and resources. And we don't need to keep those plasma cells because who's going to activate when we see it again? The memory cells, right? Those are who we need to, to stick around. Not the active fighters, but the ones that are going to remember. So in this diagram, similar to the animation that we watched, right, you have a B cell, each one of them being unique. Only one's going to recognize a particular epitope. Then it will be activated and it will proliferate. Some of them become plasma cells that, that secrete the antibodies. Others are going to be long-lived memory cells for when we see this thing again. So some names that I've used already, right? Naive, right? This is when they haven't. They've got a receptor, but they don't recognize, they have not encountered their dream antigen yet. Activated, right, they have received the appropriate signaling, interactions with cells that allow them to proliferate, right? Activation is going to lead to proliferation. They have bound antigen. They've experienced antigen. Effector cells, these are descendants of the activated lymphocytes. These actually do something, right? So they're able to produce specific cytokines. In the case of plasma cells, they're going to secrete antibodies. Helper T cells, again, they can go and help other cells. Cytotoxic T cells can go and destroy other cells. Every time a T cell or B cell has become activated and proliferated, you're going to have your effector cells, and then you're going to have ones that differentiate into your memory lymphocytes. These are long-lived descendants of once activated lymphocytes. They help seed, right? They're the memory bank, and this is what allows us to respond so much faster and much more aggressively the second time we see something. I always say, when you make a mistake, you won't do that again, right? Because you recognized it. You know what went wrong. Especially today, I burnt my hand. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> I learned from that mistake. I didn't let it cool down before taking it out the microwave. I was rushing. So helper T cells and B cell activation. We've already looked at this, right? If it's a T-dependent antigen, you've got to have that B cell activated by a helper T cell. What's the difference between primary versus secondary response? Well, primary response is the first time you see something, right? Secondary is the second time. What do you have that second time that you didn't have the first time? Antibody. You could already have antibodies. Memory cells, right? That's your advantage the second time, as if that first exposure got you to produce memory cells. All right? So, B cell right, interacts directly with antigen, it brings it in, and it could go on and proliferate and produce antigens by itself. That would be T-independent. T-dependent means it has to have that interaction with the helper T-cell before it's going to proliferate. The first time it could take from the first exposure you have to that antigen Anywhere from 7 to 14 days, the average being 10 or 12, before you have detectable antibodies in your system. 
The reason for this is because you've got to find those B cells that recognize, and you may even need the extra step of the helper T cell helping that B cell become activated, proliferate, differentiate into those plasma cells that are going to secrete antibodies. So this is, although your adaptive immune response is pretty awesome because it's a very specific response, and it's very powerful, right? We talked about all the cool things that antibodies can help us do in the detection and finding. But you have this lag period all the time when it's the first time you've seen it. You gotta, you gotta find somewhere in your body that B cell and maybe even that helper T cell that recognizes this antigen. The first antibody class you're gonna produce is IgM. Remember that one's the mega big pentamer. That one doesn't leave your blood. The most common switch is going to be to IgG. This one is prevalent all throughout your body and is the longest lived antibody you produce. But if we're, if this reaction is happening along our mucous membranes, what class of antibody would we probably produce more of? IgA. IgA. Right. And then if you're a person that's tend to have allergies, which class would that be? Good old E, right? IgE. So that's the first time. The second time, notice this response right here. Boom, there's like no lag period at all. And you get really strong, specific antibody response, in this case, an IgG. If it's in your mucous membranes, it might be an IgA response. Who got activated this time? It wasn't a naive B cell or T cell, was it? It was who? The memory cells. Right? You've already got them. So this response is fast. So what do we do to protect us against antigens and get our body to produce memory cells ahead of time? We purposely expose ourselves to antigens, don't we? What's that called? Vaccination. Vaccination is primary response, right? When you're exposed later, that would be a secondary response. And what's the benefit here? You got those memory cells, it's going to be a fast response, right? So you're not dependent on right here in this lag phase, that first response. You're dependent on your innate immune system to keep this under control. And if it fails and your adaptive doesn't kick in, what happens to you? You're going to die. Yeah. Unless we can treat you, right? If your immune system fails at eliminating an infection and there isn't a treatment, you will die. So plasma cells, these guys are gorgeous. Look at this. Huge, rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? Under the microscope, the normal stain that we do, you really can't tell one lymphocyte from another. They all look the same. Rarely are you going to see a plasma cell in your blood, but you might. And in that case, you know, the cytoplasm might be much more enlarged than normal because of that increase in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So in our primary response, the B cells are going to differentiate into plasma cells. But again, this is going to take time. You've got to find the ones that recognize they've got to be activated. After a few days, they'll undergo apoptosis. The B cells continue to proliferate, though, and differentiate in the presence of antigen, right? So they're going to keep pumping it out. So your what we call titer will steadily increase throughout infection. And that's what they were measuring here, right, the concentration of antibody, what we call titer. And those of you guys going into nursing school and stuff like that, one of the ways too they can test, and if you're pregnant, they'll test your titer for certain um, diseases like um, rubella, which you should have been vaccinated against, and you should have an antibody titer because of that, even if you never had that infection. Um, and the reason why they're checking for that one for your immunity to it is it can cause serious birth defects, right? It can, ca can cause, if you were to get the infection when pregnant, it, it will pass on to the fetus. 
Um, chicken pox is another one that can cause problems uh, for the fetus if you get it, if you've never had it before. Um, so one of the ways they can test to see if you've been vaccinated and if the vaccine did work is to look at your titers. So for antibodies, we want to be the best possible fit, right? We want the best antibody possible. So although each B cell has its specific antibody it produces by rearranging its DNA, when we have an active response, the B cells themselves will undergo small mutations in their DNA for making their antibody that B cell receptor. The pluses here denote how well that antibody is binding to the antigen. So in this case, the little bit of change that happened didn't make a much stronger antibody. It actually made a, a weaker one. That's why it has a single plus sign. So this one will not get a signal to proliferate further, right? That lineage will be discontinued. The next set of multiplication, in this case, the mutation resulted in even better affinity than the previous cells. It's got a plus three signaling. Because this one is better than this lineage, this lineage will be picked to continue on, right? So as we go, they're going to fine tune their antibodies. And the ones that have the best affinity, the best binding to the antigen, are the ones that are going to be stimulated to, to continue to produce prodigy, more clones. We refer to this process as affinity maturation. It's very similar to natural selection, right? The best fit is going to be the one that's selected to continue to proliferate. And it's little tiny spontaneous mutations on purpose, little base substitutions it does to try and have a much stronger affinity to the antigen. If you can hold on, you get to keep going. The other thing that happens is what I mentioned earlier is this class switching. So if you remember on the antibody, that stem portion is of the heavy chain is what denotes what class of antibody. And that's going to denote what parts of our immune system can communicate with this particular different antibody. So the very first antibody you're going to secrete is IgM, and that's the one the fetus produces. Even in utero, it's producing IgM. Remember, that's going to stay in the blood. It's really big. It's limited in its ability. So a continued stimulation from the immune system will typically cause what we call a switch, a class switch. The most common switch in your lymph nodes is going to be to IgG. And, and so this can go all throughout your blood, all throughout your body tissues. This is your main protective antibody is your IgG. Remember, Ig stands for what? Immunoglobulin, which is just another name for an antibody. B cells that are found in your malt, your mucus-associated lymphoid tissue, of course, it would make sense to produce IgA. That's the one that gets secreted. And remember, anybody remember what form that one is in? It's not just one little antibody. It's how many? It's two hooked together in what we call a dimer. And again, it makes them more stable and allows them to bind to antigens and hopefully stop them from binding to us. So they stay stuck in the mucus and they get washed away. So that information, once those cells have gone through that switch, though, they can't switch back because they'll do just as we saw before. They're going to cut out sections of their DNA to switch to that other class. So here they're programmed for IgM, which is the first one, if you look at the code of our DNA. Right here they're making the switch, so they're going to cut out the IgM and IgD, and they'll produce IgG. If it was in our uh, mucus-associated lymphoid tissue, they're going to cut out all the other classes and just make IgA. If it's someone who's experiencing allergy, they're going to switch to E.
So as I mentioned earlier, right, vaccination really helps exploit how our immune system works. It puts us in that second exposure, hopefully, when we actually become exposed to something. The vaccination is the primary exposure and gets our immune system to actively respond and produce those very precious memory cells. And that's why the second response is so much more rapid. Oh yeah, do we have natural fingers? So, T cell dependent antigen. So in this case, right, in order for a B cell to move forward, the T cell's got to help them out. So here we have a macrophage, right? It's engulfing an antigen. It will do it. There we go. It's going to break it into the different pieces, right? Those are the lysosomes fusing. You got your phagolysosome. Here comes the MHC class 2 in this case. So who can it communicate with? Helper T cells. So there's that helper T cell with its T cell receptor and its CD4. It becomes activated by that macrophage. Might even help that macrophage become greater killing machine. Previously, a T cell engulfed the antigen. It broke it up into pieces. It's presenting it on MHC class 2. So now that it can communicate with that helper T cell that's already been activated by the macrophage or dendritic cell, these guys agree it's the same bad guy. That B cell now gets activated by that T cell, that helper T cell. It proliferates, differentiates, got our plasma cells secreting all that beautiful antibody. And what else they would be produced that they didn't show you here? Memory cells, right? Memory T cells, memory B cells. So sometimes you need that interaction with the helper T cell. Other times the B cell doesn't need it. And that's what we call antigens that are T independent. And this happens with ones that are repetitive type antigens. Um, that have a lot of components that are very similar, like polysaccharides, poly meaning many sugars, uh, lipopolysaccharide. Anyone remember what um, bacteria have lipopolysaccharide? Is it gram positive or gram negative? Negative. Negative. That outer membrane, the outer leaflet, is made of lipopolysaccharides. And that's how um, E. coli 0157 that particular strain, 0157, actually denotes that the, the sugar combination it has in its lipopolysaccharide. Right? And unfortunately, the one that has that particular conversation that we've tagged 0157 also produces a toxin right? that's similar to Shigella. And that's why it makes you really sick. Right? That's a pathogenic strain of E. coli. You don't have E. coli 0157. If you did, you would not be in class right now. But that's, that might be one of the ways to help you remember, right? The O, they're meaning opposite of the lipid A component of the lipopolysaccharides. So these are T independent, and the reason for that is that it can bind to a lot. Do you see how the molecule itself has repeating subunits? So these are actually what's interacting with a lot of the antibodies on the surface surface of the B cell. So it's what we call string response, right? They're all kind of stringing the, the antibodies together. And that'll really help elicit that process of capping that you saw in one of the animations and cause the B cell to internalize. But then it could go on to um, proliferation and differentiation. The best cells ever, right? Natural killer cells. 
These guys are lymphocytes too, but they're not specific in regards to antigen like B cells and T cells are, right? B cells and T cells have specific receptors for specific antigens that's randomly determined when they're born. Natural killer cells, on the other hand, lack that specificity. But they have some brilliant abilities as well. One of them we've already talked about previously, and this is that antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So there is a particular class of antibody that can coat a cell, and a natural killer cell can interact with it, and it will kill that cell because the antibody is detecting there's something wrong with that cell. But only one class of antibody can do this. Which one? Of the five letters. IgG. IgG. I don't remember if I put that there. No, I didn't put it on this one. Okay, the other protective outcome we haven't talked about just yet. And that is natural killer's ability to recognize when cells are presenting MHC class 1. Remember, all our cells present MHC class 1 all the time, right? Whether it's virus infected or not, it's presenting its own self-antigens on its surface for inspection. So, sometimes some viruses, when they get inside of our cells, shut down that mechanism. They stop the cell from presenting MHC class 1. Of course, this, is an av this makes sense evolutionary-wise why it would be advantageous for the virus, right? Because if you're not presenting MHC class 1, a cytotoxic T cell can't come along and recognize and destroy the cell you're trying to use as a factory. But if you shut down MHC class 1, the good news is we've got a backup plan. And that's called a natural killer cell. The natural killer cells survey our cells and if they do not have any MHC class 1 on their surface, the natural killer cell is going to kill them. Because, again, they're not behaving normally. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They must be doing something bad and need to be eliminated. And that's what the killer cells are good at, killing cells. But notice, again, it wasn't a specific pathogen, right? It was that it wasn't presenting MHC class 1. And in this case, the specificity is due to the antibody binding, right? And the fact that a natural killer cell can bind to IgG's FC portion, right? That portion that sticks out and recognize that it's bound to a cell and then therefore destroy that cell. So they're, they're, they're lymphocytes, right? But as, I, as we've seen, they lack specificity. No antigen receptors on their surface. But they can recognize the FC portion of IgGs, right, and eliminate cells that are coated in the antibody. It's an important in the process of uh, antibody-dependent cellular toxicity, right? That's where we're using the antibodies to detect. And then the second cool thing that these guys can do is recognize cells that aren't presenting MHC class 1. And this is important, especially for viral infection. So next time, we're going to do a little activity um, that is related to some of these pictures here. So this is a process we've talked about today, right? We talked about antigen presentation. And although these guys are super cute, some of the details that we learned today are not drawn in here. So we're going to talk about these and literally um, I'll draw on the board and um, we'll discuss and review some of this material. And we'll draw in some of the specificity um, that's not included in this, in this really cute diagram. So again, I'm not a big fan of this one, right? <laughs> and how they did it. So we're going to do our own drawings, right? And and in the past, in one of the animations that somebody put up or one of the YouTube videos, the guy is drawing the stuff out. And I've said to my students in the past, I'm like, draw it out. And they're like, what do you mean draw it out? <laughs> so really, uh, I found in the last, um, last semester when I, I actually, you know, 
try to get you guys to draw and I drew really helps in the understanding of it, right? We don't have to be beautiful artists to draw, right? Um, they don't have to be as cute as this, right? Um, or as ugly as this one. We can be somewhere in between, right? But actively writing out stuff is really important in the learning process. Uh, and I find that it's, it's essential for the immune system to kind of draw out, you know, what is happening, what interactions are happening. So don't get stressed out by it, right? There's a reason for the madness of drawing. Um, so the same holds true with, with this diagram from that um, web page. So as I said before, I deduced that this was probably a B cell. Of course, they have it labeled as a B cell. Um, and my reasoning behind that was what it was interacting with. It wasn't interacting, per se, with one of our cells. It was interacting with antigen by itself. <coughs> but there's one thing I don't like about the receptor. It doesn't look like an antibody, does it? At least not the way they have it binding. So we're going to draw it a little bit better, a little bit more detailed um, on Thursday. And again, notice here they're just communicating with the B cell, right? They're not showing that interaction that's happening. Right, so we'll draw that out so we can help get it into our memory. And so since it's interacting with a B cell, is it, and a, a B cell is interacting with a T cell, is this T dependent or T independent? T dependent, right, because there's a T cell involved, right? And then we're going to have activation, proliferation, differentiation. So we get those two groups, the plasma cells and the memory cells. And I have to say the plasma cells are super cute. I love the spitting out of the antibodies. And those actually look like antibodies, but again, they're really not binding like antibodies would bind. So we'll, we'll improve upon the detail. And then we'll review, too, how awesome these antibodies are, right? Once we've coded something in antibody, what's going to happen to it? Well, one of the things that they show here that could happen is that's going to tag it for destruction. And you remember the term we use for that? When you have either C3B from complement or antibodies on the surface? Optimization, right? That tagging for destruction. And so our phagocytic cells, like dendritic cells and macrophages, can recognize this, and they're going to engulf this guy and destroy him. Now, later on, since we went through this process, later on, if we see that same bad guy again, the memory cells are what are really going to help us out, right? That were produced in this primary response. And then our memory cells will be activated the second time we see something. So I think, I don't remember if this is your guys' book or another book. This is another good one, but it's got a lot of information, right? you got to kind of tease through it. But one of the things that I like about it is it shows, right, primary, where they're coming from, right, where they hang out, these secondary lymphoid organs, Right, and the different types and who they communicate with. So this is an over this is an overall really good schematic of adaptive immune response. Um, so it takes a little while to digest through it, though, right? <laughs> but this is a good one-page synopsis of all the stuff that we've gone over. Right, even has the CD8 and CD4 in here. Right. Got your memory cells for all of them. One of the things I love about this diagram, right? Then forget about the memory cells. And then we have what the cells can actually go off and do. And notice this guy is actually heading in to the area, right? Your dendritic cell is your major communicator with those um, T cells. All right, you guys ready for a break? I know I am. <laughs> all right, so 15 minutes. It's about 20 after... So that'd be 35 after we'll get started back up again.